Not too long ago, someone came up to me and said, isn't Route 66 just another old road? And I said, yeah. But that's kind of like saying Lincoln is just another old president. I think most of us would agree there's something more to it than that. It has some sort of magic, some sort of mystique. From an academic perspective, Route 66 can be seen as symbolic. Steinbeck in The Grapes of Wrath coined the term the Mother Road to describe the hopes and dreams of the, the migrant workers as they tried to get a new life. To some, it might represent America's pursuit of freedom or our passion for mobility. It also provides a sense of nostalgia. It carries us back to a different time, not a simpler time, just a different time with different experiences, such as pre-interstate travel. It gives us the opportunity to actually live history as it was back in the day. The nickname Main Street USA came from the fact that 66 went through virtually every town between Chicago and LA. This allowed you to experience the towns, their individual uniqueness, actually meet the people, stop and shop at mom and pop businesses. Unlike today's world of identical exit ramps, each having a couple of fast food restaurants and gas stations, each town was unique. There was more to a town than just a name on the side. So therefore, the towns became an attraction in and of themselves. So as the old saying goes, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Tonight, I plan on providing a little historic background and mostly talk about some really fascinating attractions between St. Louis and Joplin as you go across Missouri. I won't be able to hit all of them. The first time I tried to do this, the presentation was like two and a half hours. So I said, I'm gonna have to edit. So bear with me. Route 66 was commissioned in 1926, and it ran for 2,448 miles from Chicago to LA. Now you may have heard that Santa, uh, that the end is at old Santa Monica, but that was added in 1935, the last 10 miles. I don't know if there's politics or what, but we want the Route 66 money coming to our town, who knows. But gradually it was decommissioned, finally, being put to rest in 1985. Therefore, it was only 59 years old at the time of its death. Now, how did this thing come about? Well, in 1921, Congress pledged a cross-country highway. By this time, there are over 20 million automobiles in America. So Congress said, okay, we're gonna give you guys a cross-country highway. This new highway will be US 60. That was per the numbering system they just come out with. And what they were trying to do is avoid the confusion of each state having its own numbering system. If you can imagine going from, from Oklahoma to Texas and so forth, each state was different. So the new system was gonna make all east-west roads even, north-south odd, and major roads would end in a zero or a five. This was not to be a new construction project. All they were doing was taking existing roads and turning them into one highway with a common name, originally US 60. Accordingly, Route 66, which was Route 66 then, that's a fun story how it, got, how it changed, but accordingly, they had to realign it several times. This was done primarily as new and better roads were built in certain sections. They'd take it over here a couple of miles. It allowed them to bypass major cities like we have 270 and things like that today. And of course, economic and political clout. Everybody wanted a dollar along the way from the traveler. So in other words, US 66 never stayed in the same place very long. So we're ready to go now? Not really. Being upset that no route ended in a zero in Kentucky, William Fields, the governor, throws a hissy fit because I want a zero highway in my state. Well, he made such a fuss. Finally, the federal official said, fine. 60 will be assigned to a Kentucky highway. The new route will be 62. After all, it's just a number. 
So, we're making progress? Not really. <laughs> There's more to it than that. The Missouri Chief Highway Engineer, A.H. Pepmeyer, and Oklahoma's Highway Chairman, Cyrus Avery, dug their heels in and they said, we will take 60 and only 60. It's a major road, it needs a major number. These are the guys in charge of all this, fighting over numbers. Well, while meeting in Springfield, Missouri, Avery and Pepmeyer were there together, they would meet there frequently. Pepmeyer figures out that the kind of catchy sounding number 66 is not assigned to any road. Avery and he together say, yep, this is, we'll go with this. So they send a telegram off to federal officials saying, we will accept the designation 66, but not 62. <laughs> so on November 11th, 1926, the new highway becomes US 66. Springfield immediately claims we're the birthplace of Route 66. <laughs> then we're ready to go. Well, let's look at the first map of US 66 that Missouri put out. What's wrong with this picture? It says 60. No one told the map makers they changed the name. Talk about confusion. This is gonna end confusion. Anyway, since this was a new road, was not a new road, it was a hodgepodge of existing roads, it shouldn't be surprising that only 800 of the 2,400 miles, 2,400 plus miles, were paved. Missouri was somewhat better having only, or having 200 or 306 miles paved. Overall, that's not too bad given this is 1926. The Model T was still pretty new. So, as we come into, uh, as Route 66 approaches Missouri, it enters Missouri via the McKinley Bridge. Now, some believe that Route 66 in St. Louis is one of the hardest parts of the highway, or I'm sorry, part, the hardest part of Route 66 to navigate. And that's because at one time, there were over 80 different streets that were part of Route 66 within the city of St. Louis. <laughs> Next time you drive through St. Louis, look for those historic 66 signs. They're everywhere. Now, if we look at this map we have here, you'll see the three main, I don't know if you can see that or not, but you'll see the three main alignments. The 1926 alignment was a temporary route. That's the red one that came over the McKinley Bridge. It was temporary until the Merrimack River Bridge could be completed. Once the Merrimack River Bridge is complete, they drop Route 66 down through South County and South, South St. Louis, that would be the blue route, and in 1935, the bypass, when you loop around the city, comes over the old Chain of Rocks Bridge, goes through North County, and then cuts down through Limburg until it catches up with the 33 alignment. So, now in my opinion, Chain of Rocks Bridge is probably the most unique bridge entered in Missouri. And that's because, as you can see in the picture there, there was a 22 degree bend in the middle of the bridge. Now, as a kid, we used to drive over that thing as teenagers. I never thought about, gee, this is stupid. They've got a bend right in the middle. I just accepted it. The bend is there because you needed to help tra river traffic align with the current to avoid the piles from the bridge as well as the water and tape towers of the St. St. Louis Water Department. Now, in 1968, the old Chain of Rocks Bridge closed. In 99, it opened as a pedestrian bicycle path, and I would strongly suggest if you get a chance, go out there and walk it. It's about a mile across, except I found out recently they have finally closed the Missouri side for parking. You have to go to Illinois. It has something to do with crime. People would go out there in Missouri, they come back, and their cars been broken into. So Illinois beat us on that one. Now, if we're on the 1933 alignment and we're heading down um, Chippewa and Watson, I usually think of those as the same thing. One turns into the other. We're gonna pass a couple of classic St. Louis attractions. And these pretty much speak for themselves. There you've got the donut drive-in, that's on, on Chippewa, and almost directly across the street, 
what else can be said other than Ted Cruz? <laughs> so I don't think I need to say much other than this part of the road is a real sweet ride. <laughs> now, one time there were over 30 motels along Watson Road. Many of these are now, are still there, but none compared with the Coral Court. This is what I would call St. Louis's most iconic ghost attraction. And what a ghost attraction is, it's something that is no longer there except in spirit. Now when John Carr opened this in 1942, he wanted something that would stand out from other mom and pop operations. The Coral Court did just that. It said that the honey-colored glazed bricks and the glass block windows reflected both the sunshine and the headlights, creating a very special aura. However, although in the beginning it was considered one of the classic motels, before long it got a reputation as the no-tell motel with a touch of class. <laughs> now, how did this come about? Good question. Now this may sound silly, but garages. The court had a garage for every unit. So it led to an air of secrecy. You could drive in, go into your room, and nobody knew you were there. Now on the other hand, this was not uncommon for most motels of that time. That was one of the amenities they would put in motels to get you to stay there. There were two more we're gonna talk about tonight that had, they don't have this reputation, but they had garages. Another thing was, in order to get the truck drivers to stop there, Carr, the owner, started offering them reduced partial rates. This was translated into, you can get a room by the hour. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, it didn't help that the kidnapper and murderer of Kansas City's Bobby Greenleaf was captured at the Carl Court. Now, if you're not familiar with the Greenleaf's case, Bobby Greenleaf was a six-year-old son of a wealthy Kansas City auto dealer. He was kidnapped by Carl, Carl Hall and his girlfriend, Bonnie Hetty. Talk about a good date. Let's go out and kidnap a kid. Anyway, they eventually kill him and get $600,000 ransom. Hall ends up at the Carl Court where he's arrested. But this didn't help for the reputation. Now, the ori uh, original entrance signs, you can see one of them here, are available to Route 66 Museum on display there in Eureka. And it's really a neat little museum. I'd strongly recommend if you get a chance, go by there. Maybe it takes 30 minutes to go through there, but they have some pretty good stuff. Also, if you see there, there's a replica of one of the units. This is at the Transportation Museum in West County. And this was actually made with some of the materials that they um, salvaged following the demolition of the court. Well, the court started to fall on hard times when I-44 bypassed Watson Road. This resulted in what I call DBI. Anybody know what DBI is? Death by interstate. Death by interstate. Very good. <laughs> the loss of revenue resulted in code violations, which forced the court to close in 1993. Being either unable or unwilling to make the needed repairs, Carr's, wi Carr's widow, Jesse, sold the motel to developers who planned to build a subdivision on the site. This sparked a public outcry. You may remember a columnist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Elaine Veets. She led a one-woman crusade with her columns. Save the Carl Court. Yes, it's a nasty place, but it's our nasty place. We gotta get it on the National Register of Historic Places. And that they did. But they didn't get it on the National Register of Historic Places. The Carl Court had to go. It was demolished in 1995. And on the, on the right side, it was kind of funny, if this can be funny, since $300,000 of the uh, Bobby Greenlee's ransom money was not found, a bunch of people showed up going through the rubble looking for the $300,000. This reminds me of that movie, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, if you've ever seen that. Now, there was an interesting sign that was put up at the end. 
you probably can't read that, but it says, this was put up by the demolition company, it's checkout time at the Coral Court, no more one night stands. <laughs> about all, I didn't do that, the, the company that tore it down did. All that's left is the entrance gates going into the court. That's actually a wall for somebody's backyard, which is kind of neat until you look out, you see some nut like me across the street, hey, let's take pictures. <laughs> By the time one approaches the present-day interchange of I-270 and I-44, he would have been in the boonies back up until about the mid-1960s. You wouldn't run into much of anything until you hit the Times Beach, Sharika area, and you ran into the Bridgehead Inn. This was what I would describe as a classic roadhouse. Like many roadhouses, it had a checkered past. It provided food, drink, lodging, and other not so legal activities going on there. In 1946, Edward Steinberg took over, renamed it Steinies, and I've talked to a lot of people who were probably in my age range, they remember it as Steinies. I, I don't think too many of us here would have remembered it as, as the bridgehead. But Steinies. He did a pretty good job of trying to turn it into a more family-friendly or uh, venue. Today, it's home to the Route 66 Museum that I mentioned earlier. And so if you've been there, you've been at the old bridgehead in Steinies Inn. Now, right west of the, of the bridgehead is the old Merrimack River Bridge. This is the one they had to wait for before they could open the 1933 alignment. Currently, there's a group of people raising money to turn this into a bicycle and pedestrian bridge, and hopefully they'll do that someday. Just north of the bridgehead was the old Sylvan Beach Park. Uh, this is kind of an interesting place because we don't see places like this anymore. It offered an assortment of activities that included swimming, ball fields, auto racing, horseback riding, as well as a couple of restaurants. One of the, and if you look here at the, the postcard, that is the Merrimack Bridge, and right to the east of that would have been the Bridgehead Inn, and a little further east would have been the current 270, I'm sorry, 244 Bridge. One of the restaurants they had there had an interesting um, ad, and the, there it is, good. It's a Sylvan Beach Cottage, and they have something called a glorified hamburger. I don't know what that is, but it's probably good. That was more of a cafe. If you wanted full service meals, you wanted to go to the Sylvan Beach restaurant. That was in here in the inset, and that would be the one up there. And this sign is on display at the Reed 66 Museum in, in Eureka. Because many people, uh, it, I'm sorry. Because many buildings that once lined Route 66 are still standing in Pacific today, many people think this is where we get the first real taste of Missouri's Mother Road. And that's probably true, except a lot of these buildings are, I guess we should say, repurposed so you won't recognize them unless you know what you're looking for. But this one here, I bet you're going to recognize, if you've ever been to the Pacific, you've seen the Red Cedar Inn. Now this has an interesting backstory because it was opened by a couple of ex-bootlegging brothers. Prohibition ended and put these guys out of work. So they decided, we're going to open a bar. And that they did. Timing was on their side. Not only was Prohibition over, but this is the exact time Route 66 on the 33 alignment is reaching Pacific. So you got the highway, you got drinking is legal. What else could you ask for? Uh, it did have an interesting group of people that sometimes uh, showed up there. It's rumored that many members of the St. Louis Cardinals used to go out there. Remember in the 30s, it was all day games. What do you think these guys did at night? <laughs> and one of them was Dizzy Dean. I can see that. Another one was kind of a surprise. A Boston Red Sox, whenever the uh, Red Sox were in St. Louis to beat up on the Browns, Ted Williams used to go there. 
So Ted and Dizzy. Currently, it's owned by the City of Pacific and they're in the process of turning it into a museum and a visitor center. Now, if you look at the map there, the red, and I know it's hard to see that, but the red highway, that's the original 26, that's coming out 100. The blue would be the 1933 alignment that runs through Pacific and parallels 44. So if you were approaching Gray Summit from the 26 alignment, you'll find, and I think the sign's still there, it's not a city anymore, a place called Hollow. And at one time, this was the site of a stagecoach relay station. And in 1930, George and Molly Stovall bought the property. Stovall's Grove, exactly. They opened this place, it had a few cabins to rent, a restaurant, a bar, of course, and later they ran a post office out of here. Now it's interesting, usually we have the old death by interstate, but even with the new 1933 alignment, Stovall's Grove survived, and it still thrives today, probably because of the support of locals as well as music fans. I understand they have top line country music there. <laughs> now, if you're on the 1933 alignment, you're going to come to, you probably passed this but wouldn't recognize it, the Trails End Motel. Now, from the postcard, it's still there in one farm or the other. We'll see in a minute. But from the postcard, I'd say in 1945, that's a pretty nice place. It's got a little picket fence, flowers, window fans. That was a big deal in the 40s. If you remember, if you were my age, I can remember motels advertising we have air conditioning in the 50s and 60s, window fans in the 40s. Now, you gotta love old time advertising. A 1950s newspaper ad described the trails end as, quote, ultra modern and a good place to house extra house guests. <laughs> so if the in-laws are coming or something, put them up at the trail end. <laughs> Now, in all fairness, remember, most of these places did not have very much of an advertising budget. They were mom and pop. The copy was probably written by mom and or pop or both, or who knows? Maybe the family dog. But I thought that was kind of cool. The only thing that you will see, what will really trigger it off is, the sign is still there, and I apologize, the day I took this, it was overcast. And if you notice, the sign is one of those that at one time said motel, not Trails End Motel, just motel. And that's interesting because you bought the letters and paid for M-O-T-E-L was five letters. Trails and Motel was a lot more letters. That sign was put up so that you could see it from the interstate in the 1970s. Uh, have you ever seen uh, restaurants? They don't say the restaurant just says eat. That's the same, that's only three letters, a lot less than restaurant. Today, it's a private residence. So if you drive by there, you'll see, you can see the, how the motel was, where it was, but I don't think you would recognize it unless you knew you were looking for it. I'm sure most of us have seen these signs before. And I'd like to focus first off on the Garden Way, and then I'll get back later to the Diamond Inn. Louis Echo Camp opened this in 1945, the Garden Way in 1945, and it's named after a stretch of highway that the botanical gardens had landscape coming out of St. Louis. It was an inline design motel with 25 units. In the early 50s, they added another 16 with a second building. And it appeared on the cover, if anyone has ever seen Bill Hart's historic Missouri roadways, uh, it's a travel book about Missouri's back roads and things like that. This was on the cover of the first edition. The second edition that came out recently has the old Dutch tavern on the cover. <laughs> so he's keeping it local. Now, the thing that made this place stand out is the sign. Now, not only would, were these neon signs designed to get your attention, that certainly would, coming down a dark road, look, and this is pre-TripAdvisor days, pre-internet and all this stuff. You saw a sign and you stopped. But they also helped you get into the motel. Have you ever noticed how a lot of these old motel signs have arrows? The roads are dark. They're showing you here's the path to the office so you don't drive right through the office. 
in 2014 it closed. I'm not sure, but I've heard that it was there one day and the next day they just locked the door and it was gone. I don't know if that's true or not. If anybody does, let me know one way or the other. You can see here that it's pretty much disrepaired. You're losing part of the garden wing on the roof and that was put up there primarily like the trail's end to try to catch interstate traffic. This picture on the left was taken about two years ago, and you can see it's in pretty bad shape. This past January, I was out there, and the garden way and the motel sign are gone, and all of the glass bricks are broken out. So this thing is experiencing some vandalism. The last time I was out there, somebody was nice enough to tear some doors off, and break some windows so I could get better pictures. They knew I was coming. There's the office, one of the rooms. It's just like, I just don't get it. Why go, why break into a motel and destroy the table? Now this intrigues me over here, and I know you guys can't see from back there. This was on the floor, along with a lot of brochures like you normally see in motels. Here you've got one for Jesse James Wax Museum, um, some Merrimack Caverns, which is to be expected around here. But this one says, vacancy for room C clerk at the Diamond Inn Motel. They're both owned by Echo Camp. I think, and I may be wrong, but I'm thinking late at night, or when you hit a certain time, the garden way may not have been staffed. So if you pull up at nine o'clock at night, you had to go two blocks east, get your key, and then come back. So obviously it's in pretty bad shape today. Villa Ridge has often been referred to as the crossroads of Missouri. That's because you had two of the state's oldest roads meeting there, the wagon road that led to Springfield, along with the state road that went to Jeff City. It was here that a young Spencer Groth and his sister Ursula, I believe that's Ursula in the picture there, I don't know for sure, but I think it is, opened a small banana stand. It was a fruit stand, yeah. They called it banana stand because one of the highway workers said, it looks like a place I saw in Springfield that's called the banana stand. So Ralph said, okay, we'll call it the banana stand. I don't know where he got bananas. <laughs> yes, we have no bananas today. Now, the next year he added a gas pump, started selling sandwiches, and when he started staying open 24-7, the truck drivers loved him. Although Route 66 doesn't exist yet, this is probably the first truck stop on Route 66. When Gruff learned this new high route was coming, he decided to replace the temporary structure with a permanent building. The new building would be a full-scale restaurant, and it was shaped like, the diamond, like a diamond. And you guessed it, the original diamonds. We'll call that Diamonds 1.0. If you look at the picture there in the lower right, you can see the corner of a diamond. And it was a pretty impressive restaurant for back in the 19, this, let's see, this was 1927. It was probably symbolic, but the restaurant opened on the very same day that Route 66 hit Villa Ridge, July 3rd, 1927. You gotta love the old time pictures and slogans. The Diamonds, the old reliable eating place. When you look at, I hear you saying about the, talking about the dresses, do you know why that started with restaurants? If your employees look like nurses, you've got clean food. <laughs> it started, I think, with a hot dog. It might have been Nathan's Hot Dogs in um, New Jersey or somewhere on the East Coast, wherever Nathan's is. If you look at their menu, and I know I'm telling you to look at something you probably can't read, I can't read it from here, but for 50 cents you can get a steak plate dinner that comes with two vegetables and a drink. <laughs> now, in 1938, I believe it was, Gruff decided it's time to sell. So he sold to a one-time dishwasher who had worked up to become general manager, Louis Echocamp. And his partner, Echocamp's partner, was a fellow named Noble Key. That's two names, Noble as in royalty, and Key, K-E-Y, is his last name. 
he was the night shift manager. If I'm not mistaken, and feel free to correct me, the one there, the, the tall guy there that she's trying to hit with the laser, that's uh, Gruff, I think. To the left is probably Ursula, his sister. That's Louis Echocamp there. And to Echocamp's right, that I believe I've been told that is Noble Keith, who was working as just in the night shift. You were a waiter and also in charge of the place. Well, business was good. In 1947, they served over almost a million and a half customers. That's a lot of food. One of the reasons they sold so much food is they started giving free food to bus drivers. Here comes a bus with 60 people. I'll feed you, you bring the other 59 in there. <laughs> Unfortunately, in 1948, a fire destroyed the entire building. Following the fire, Equicamp bought Key's share of the business and decided, I'm building a new, new restaurant and in 1949, he opened Diamonds 2.0, the one that most of us remember. When I say most of us, if you don't remember it, I'm not trying to insult you. But I did not realize until I saw this picture, it says the diamonds on the roof. I'd never flown over it before. But anyway, you can see here, there are three buses along with a ton of cars. You had cabins you could rent. There's at least one bus there that had swimming pools gas station, it had pretty much everything you could want. In fact, you can see there its new slogan, world's largest roadside restaurant. And that might have, been, might have been pretty close to being real. Now by the late 60s, however, business was starting on the turn down. The interstate and aging building with no room for expansion really hurt things. So Echo Camp decided, what the heck, let's build a new building. So he moved back to Gray Summit in 1971, and he opened the Diamond Inn over there. And if you look over there, and you see where it says Texaco, you see the red roof, that was the actual Diamond's restaurant. To the right of it was the gas station. And you can see the motel up there with the pool, that's the motel there. I think at the end of its life, that was the uh, a travel lodge, Diamond Inn Travel Lodge. I'd heard that he had expected to be able to get some Six Flags business by being that close to Six Flags. I don't know if that's true or not. It makes sense. So if we move a little bit down the highway, I'm oh, sorry, we're not moving down the highway yet. We're still at the Diamonds. One more. Oh, sorry. The old diamonds became the Tri-County truck stop. And many of us can remember back in the day, that was the only place that was open when the bars closed. So on Friday and Saturday night, you can imagine the clientele, truck drivers and drunks. And teenagers. Who could be, who could be both, drunk and teachers? You can see that this is pretty much in bad shape today. Once again, I did not break in. The door was open. <laughs> they were getting ready for a ghost hunt, seriously. They were going to have a ghost guy go look far. Some of the people that may still be occupying that place. So is it really abandoned? Well, let's see. It's claimed that there's something called a blood monster there. I have no idea what that is, but I don't want to know. There was a ghost named George, and the rumor here is George was a one-time employee who got fired because he tried to get too frisky with his female co-workers. So when he died, he came back to haunt the place. So now we can move on down the road. Frequently, people assume Route 66 consisted of two lanes, and that's true depending on where and when. What many of us are not aware of there were three lane sections and there was one right past the diamonds. The middle lane was a passing lane. There's no need to have four, you get an eastbound, westbound, you go in the middle and you pass until people started deciding, I'm going to just stay here because I'm going to pass the next guy I come upon. Great, until the guy coming the other direction shows up. 
These became known as suicide lanes, and fortunately they were taken out before long. I did a little math on here, and I'm not good at math, but it says Red Cedar in 10 miles. So I went to the Red Cedar, drove back 10 miles. This would put us, this picture is right out at the Bridgewater subdivision on AT. And if you look way back here, I know, if we'll look, yeah, look at the sign you can't see. That says the new diamonds. So that must have been put up after, um, I don't know, I guess that would be the uh, Diamonds 2.0. Continuing west, you're going to run into the Sunset Motel. This was a 12 unit that was opened by the Lovelace family in 1947. It's somewhat unique in that it had front doors and back doors to each room. You would drive around the back of the building and you would enter your room from the back door. The front door opened up into a courtyard that you could sit and visit. This was not unusual in the pre-air conditioning days. I think they had flower gardens out there and all this kind of good stuff. It's a pretty neat thing. In 1971, the Kruger family bought it, turned it into moderately priced rentals for a while. I don't know when they uh, got rid of the rentals, but it's been abandoned for quite a year. But fortunately, a preservation group has been working on it, and they've redone the roof as well as the sign. And that picture doesn't do the sign justice, but it is pretty cool. I'm hearing sounds that you guys know where this is. That's the old Zephyr Station. Now this was the second building on that site. The original burned down in 1943, and this one was put up there in 46. Uh, when I was taking this picture, it's kind of an interesting story. I hear a car in the gravel, and a guy says, what are you doing? I thought, I'm busted. I know it's private property. I said, I'm taking pictures of Route 66. Well, this guy, he was older than me. I think he was there when they commissioned Route 66 and 20. He remembered that. He starts telling me, and I think this is, why else would he tell me this? But the story must be true, that when the owner died, the family didn't want to operate the gas station and the restaurant. They didn't want to sell it, so here it sits. For how much longer, I don't know. So if you don't believe that story, I'm telling you what a probably 80 something year old man told me. Now, a little bit further, we have the twin bridges going over the Burgess River. This is just outside Union. The first bridge was built in 1925, the second in 1935. The Keys Twin Bridge Cafe and Gas Station opened up just east of the ridges. And if you see the red arrow, that's pointing to a logo for the restaurant. And I have a little better picture in a second. There you go. That's the actual sign that was outside the Keys Cafe. You can see this outside the Route 66 Museum in Eureka. As you go in, it's on the left side of the building. Now, if the name Keys sounds familiar, do some math. 1948, who sold out to Echo Camp? Keys. Yeah. What year did he open this? I think he took the profits from that sale and opened this right down the road. Stanton home to Missouri's ultimate roadside attraction, Merrimack Caverns. Now, this was opened by tours by a fellow named Lester Dill, who I think I would have enjoyed meeting. He opened it up to tours in 1935, and it's reported that he said, I'll do anything to promote Merrimack Caverns, and he sure as heck did. Beginning in the 1930s, Dill went around painting the barns. He, any barn, I'll paint your barn for free. Just let me put roots here. I'm sorry, Merrimack Caverns on the building. And we've all seen those kind of barns. He also is credited with inventing the bumper sticker. And this was not the cell. You got one free when you went in. Unless you didn't want one, you had to put your windshield wipers up in an upright position. I would think, like, if that would have happened, my dad would be, get the damn, wolf, the wolf. we're not doing this, not on my car. But anyway, barns and bumper stickers. My guess is, I don't think it's a guess, it's probably pretty accurate. Dill's greatest marketing feat was his claim that the caverns once was the hideout of Jesse James. This was based on having found a Civil War era pistol in the cave. Jesse James was in the Civil War. That must be his cap, his pistol. 
makes sense. And since he knew where the cave was, that's where he and the gang hung out. Now, in 1949, Dill took it to the next level when he brought J. Frank Dalton in, who passed himself off as the 103-year-old Jesse James. I don't believe this is Jesse. This is an old guy trying to add to his Social Security money. <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, a side note, Dalton also did this for other famous historians. He'd just show up and he'd be, whoever. who do you want me to be and what are you going to pay me? <laughs> Now, this is one of my favorite, you're probably noticing I have lots of favorite, what I would call survivors. I like the ones that are just barely standing. But anyway, this is the old Delta Motel. Later it becomes the Park Inn 66. Uh, it was built hoping to catch, catch on to, or kept, I'm sorry, take advantage of the popularity of Maribel Caverns. It's right there with the highway going down to the caverns. It consisted of nine units and was expanded later to 40. The rounded tower was there to get your attention. And it would, so the lower level was the office. Upstairs was the restaurant, which I think would be kind of neat to have the restaurant upstairs. Like the garden way, the delta is abandoned and shows the effects of vandalism. And I promise you, I did not tear the doors off of this place. But I was able to get a picture of the room. <coughs> And you can see, at least it has a pool. What it doesn't have is chlorine. <laughs> now in Sullivan, you may be familiar with what was called the Shamrock Court. This opened in 1945, and it's made with sandstone, which is a fairly common material that's used as you approach and go deeper into the Ozarks. I've seen it as far south as Oklahoma. Uh, it was very common in the day. As you can tell here, there is a restoration group. They gravel the parking lot. The first time I was there, it was snowy and I was afraid I was gonna get stuck. The roof has been redone and they've refurbished the sign. They've done a good job. Many towns along Route 66 have their iconic attraction. For Cuba, that attraction is the wagon wheel. These Tudor-style cabins opened in 1936 by Robert and Margaret Martin, and the wheel is the oldest continually operating motel on Route 66. Not just Missouri, but there's no other motel that's never closed that's been there as long as this place. According to an ad they had, and you gotta love these old ads, they advertised we have a private tub or shower bath, gas fans, heat and summer, and enclosed garages. Carl Court has nothing on them. After World War II, they uh, remodeled the garages and turned them into additional rooms. The four-way, you've probably seen this if you've been through Cuba, is right at the intersection of Route 66 and Franklin. Originally, it was car service station, opened in 1932, and over the years, it's been pretty much everything from a car dealer, a bakery, several restaurants, and goodness knows what else. Now, there's an interesting story that goes with this. The current owners, Bill and Lynn Wallace, were approached by an investment group wanting to buy their property. They suspected they were going to tear the building down and turn it into a fast food restaurant. They said, no, thank you. So bully for them. Now we know that Cuba is often called Mural City because of all the murals. I think there's 17 or 18, it could be up to 20. Now there are a lot of them. Obviously we can't do all, but I'm gonna do a couple of them with people that don't, the people that are the subject of this are not people you would normally associate with Route 66. When was the last time you said Route, I'm sorry, Cuba, Missouri, and Amelia Earhart? Her mural was on the side of a car wash, and it tells the story of 1928 it was. She took off from uh, from Illinois, I think she left from Scott Airfield, as it was called back in the day, on her way to LA. She got as far as Cuba, suspected engine problems, landed, checked it out, all was well, and she went on her merry way and made it to LA. Cuba's brush with aviation history. <laughs> The other mural, when's the last time you equated Cuba with Betty Davis, the actress? This, 
1948, Davis and her husband, William Sherry, stopped in Cuba while traveling cross country. The 19-year-old Wilbur Vaughn, Wilbur Vaughn, a part-time photographer for the local newspaper, approached the couple and said, can I take a picture? And Sherry said, no. He took the picture anyway and took off running. <laughs> Later, he's, he, in an interview, he says, I didn't think I'd run into an Academy Award-winning actress in town after this, so I was going to take the opportunity. <laughs> Sherry takes off after him, according to the story. But the 19-year-old is too fast for the middle-aged Sherry. Plus, it's reported Sherry slipped and fell face down in a mud puddle. <laughs> Not only did the photo wind up in the local newspaper, but it reported that the couple had turkey dinners at the Southern Hotel restaurant that night. <laughs> Fanning is right down the road. And they've got a nice little gift shop there. They're also the home to the world's second largest rocking chair. It's the second, it was 42 feet. KC, Illinois built a new one at 56 feet and one inch. By accident, I can say I've seen the top two. Now, speaking of tall, the Edmund Long Hotel in Raleigh is the tallest building in Raleigh. Today, it's the Phelps County Bank. And you can see it really hadn't changed a whole lot. The Edwin Long, Edwin Long was a first-rate hotel. It had 75 rooms. And you can tell it was really upscale. They charged $2 for a double, three for, I'm sorry, $2 for a single, three for a double. And this is in the early days of the Great Depression. Each room supposedly had a tub shower, there you go again, and radiant heat. Now, if the upscale Edwin Long is not to your liking or it doesn't fit your budget, go a little further to Newburgh and you can stay at John's Modern Cabins. The first thing I notice about it is the size. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are laughing at one of my favorite surviving attractions. <laughs> Thanks. Now, okay, I didn't build it, no. This included, this included cabins as well as a dance hall. I think that's long gone. The cabins prospered during the Second World War due to its proximity to Fort Leonard Wood. Owner John Dobbs was proud of his nickname, Sunday John, because he openly violated the blue laws and sold beer on Sunday. The GIs from Fort Leonard Wood liked that. They thought that was good. Now, I, like I said, I've been there a couple of times, and each time I'm there, there are a few cabins. I guess the next time it's going to be John's three-quarter cabin or something. <laughs> so I don't know how much longer it's going to be there. You also can find in this area the Stony Dell Resort, or at least the ruins of the Stony Dell Resort. Yeah. Uh, this was a little more upscale than John's Modern Cabins, but like the cabins, and also, there we go, there's their uh, store, both then and now, hadn't changed much. But this was a favor with the military personnel, as well as a lot of local families, travelers, and various groups and group, group outings. The Trinity Resort included pools, tennis courts, a restaurant, dance hall, and a justice of the peace. Well, this was World War II, and a lot of these guys figured, I'm going to get married before I go off. <laughs> and get shot in the war. The pool was spring fed, and I recently read something that said the water is between upper 50s and lower 60s. Oh, yeah. yeah. We swam. <laughs> it was that cold? Oh, yeah. I'll take your word for it. They had a celebrity, too, that stayed there once. Anyone ever hear of Mae West, the 1930s movie star? She was there on at least one occasion. So, Devil's Elbow is an unincorporated area in Pulaski County. It's one of the most scenic spots on Route 66. It began as a lumber camp, and the, the name came from the fact that when logs were floated down the, the river, they would jam at a really sharp, abrupt bend. It's reported that the lumberjacks would say, that's a devil of an elbow. I kind of think their language was a little stronger than that. I just can't, 
maybe it's a stereotype of what lumberjacks are like, but anyway, the whole area became known as Devil's Elbow. Right next to the bridge is the Elbow Inn, which currently is going, it's being remodeled. I didn't know that until we went there not too long ago this early summer, and it was closed. And I looked yesterday and it's still closed. But that was the old Munger Moss Cafe and Sandwich Shop. Now the Munger Moss Sandwich Shop did a really good business because they had an outstanding barbecue. Unfortunately for Munger and her second husband, Emmett Moss, who is Nellie Munger and Emmett Moss, the wartime realignment took Route 66 away from their front door. By 1945, business was down, so they sold to Jesse and Pete Hudson. As soon as they bought the, the restaurant, they made sure they got the recipe for the barbecue. They took off and set up an operation in Lebanon. They bought the old chicken shanty restaurant and turned that into their version of the Munger Moss Cafe. About a half a mile from there is Hooker Cut, and this is one of the reasons that the Munger Mosque went under. Uh, during World War II, they did a little realignment uh, of the highway, so make it easier to transport troops back and forth and equipment to Fort Leonard Wood. And construction crews had a heck of a job trying to cut through 90 feet of rock. That was at the time the deepest road cut in the United States, and it ran for almost a half a mile. This was also the first four-lane section of Route 66. Gasco's Ark, that's one of those fun words to say, Gasco's Ark. This is an unincorporated area in the Ozarks. The region is a, com the name is a combination of Gasconade River and the Ozarks. It has three interesting attractions there. The first is the Gasco's Ark service station and cafe. It's a neat building, especially this rounded parapet, parapet at the top, and that rock there is actually what they call giraffe rock because it looks like the height of a giraffe. I think it's a you know, similar to the sandstone, just a variation of it. But this was opened by Frank Jones, who, by the way, was the guy that came up with the term Gasco's Ark. About a mile or two from there is the Lost Gas Station. It's overgrown, it looks, you know, it's, it's interesting. Now this intrigues me because I cannot find anything out about this other than it was there. I'm guessing it was built in the 1960s or early 70s. It's got the slanted canopy with some red trim on the top, so maybe it was a Phillips 66, but who knows. And then just past there is the old Gasconade Bridge that closed in 2014. Currently, there's an effort to restore this for bicycle and pedestrian traffic. Next stop, Lebanon. When approaching Lebanon, just west of the I-44 Speedway, you're gonna see a googie sign, cafe sign in a cow pasture. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar with googie, that was a type of architect that was very popular in the 50s. A lot of sharp angles, and you can see that on the sign. It's got some sharp angles there. Right next to the sign, or not really next, but pretty close, is what appears to be an oversized water heater, just sitting out in a cow pasture. I didn't think anything of it because I've seen lots of weird stuff in fields. Well, you're not hallucinating when you see this. This is part of the old satellite cafe and the space station gas station. The Satellite Cafe and the gas station both opened in the 1950s. Norma and Lauren Alloway ran the cafe, and Leroy Hawkins was the owner of the gas station. The cafe burned down in 1999, and the water heater wasn't really a water heater, and I know you're not going to be able to see this. That's the water heater. It was a rocket ship outside the space station gas station. If I'd have known that, I would have taken a picture. The cafe stools and um, counter were salvaged after the fire that burned this place down, and they are on display at the Lebanon Route 66 Museum. That's, in my opinion, the finest Missouri Route 66 Museum. So it's really, they've got a lot of cool stuff there. 
This menu is a little more expensive than the diamonds. Remember, this was 1950-something. Also in Lebanon, we're going to find the Munger Moss Motel. This was opened in 1946 by Pete and Jesse Hudson. If that name sounds familiar, they're the people that bought the Munger Moss Cafe. And they just decided, well, we'll call this Munger Moss too. The, the sign there is really interesting. You can, I know you can't see it, but the sign shows various points of interest on Route 66 and the mileage. When I was putting this presentation together, I realized I spent too much time on Route 66 because I've been to every one of those. <laughs> so I need to get a life. There was the original switchboard that's in the Lebanon Museum. And there's just something about this sign I think is so cool. It's classic 1950s and 60s. Tell me if I'm wrong or not, but does it remind you of the Holiday Inn signs of that same era? Could we have copyright violations here? I don't know. There's another fun place in Lebanon, Camp Joy. This was operated by the Spears family and it began as a tent camp in 1927. In the 1920s, most hotels were either by railroad stations or in the downtown area. So if you were driving by car in the 20s, you'd either just sleep on the side of the road or if you were really lucky, you could find the tent camp. Um, over time, the Spears built cabins, added a store, gas station, and it turned into a pretty nice operation. I think the tents went for 50 cents a night and cabins were one to a dollar to a dollar fifty. But then again, this is probably in the 30s. They had some interesting guests, both famous and infamous. The musician Tex Ritter apparently stayed there, along with a young comedian, a guy named Bob Hope. Bob Hope is reported to have said in an interview when he was asked, have you ever done anything that you regret? He said, yeah skipping out without paying Camp Joy in Lebanon, Missouri. I don't think he ever went back and paid. They had some infamous guests there too, and you guessed it, our friends Bonnie and Clyde. Now, interesting story, you see the little girl there, her name is Joy, and a lot of people think that she was named after Camp Joy, or Camp Joy was named after her. She said, no, I was, the camp was two years old, they named me after the camp. When she was an older lady, in an interview, she said, I remember Bonnie and Clyde being there. She said they were very nice and polite. They stayed to themselves, well, at least until the police showed up, and then they left in a hurry. <laughs> Niangua, if I'm pronouncing that right. This place, the Abbey Lee Courts, has one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites, if you haven't guessed. This sign is really cool. And the cabins still are among the trees, as the sign says, but now they're weekly run or they're apartments. Not weekly, but they're apartment units. Not far from there is the old Nanka gas station and store. And this is this place just it you know, I think it's really cool because with a little bit it's on a very deserted part of the road, with a little imagination. You get the idea. Can you imagine working there by yourself late at night? feeling of loneliness and the excitement, like, oh my goodness, it's, it's somebody's going to buy gas. I sure hope it's not Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> we all know that Springfield is the home of, and birthplace of Route 66, Missouri's third largest city, but they're also home of one of the last remaining classic vintage 1962 steak and shakes. But that's not the real food story here. The real story goes around a place called Red's, opened by Red Cheney in 1947. Now, Red was known for serving very large hamburgers. So he decided he wanted to advertise this. So he goes out and buys a pole, buys some letters, and he puts up the sign there. What's wrong with the sign? Can you see it or not? It's H-A-M-B-U-R-G, and there's no E-R. <laughs> Giant Hamburg. <laughs> now, there are two questions to ask about this. Or there, there are big, one question, why? 
I found two stories. The first is, Red was a better cook than mathematician. He miscalculated the size of his pole, the letters, and when he put it in, I've got two, you ever put something together and you got extra parts? He had an E and an R. The other story is, he left those off so he could go under where she's pointing is a power line. I don't know if either one of those is true, but I think my theory is probably right. From what I can tell, Red was a very charismatic, really cool guy. He was everybody's best friend. You've met those kind of guys. It all revolved around him. Maybe he did this on purpose to get you to check out his motel, draw attention to him and his restaurant. Not a bad deal if you're advertising. Over here, he also is given credit for having the first drive through window. And that's Red waving to customers as they go by. After Red's closed in the 1980s, the city built a replica sign. There you can probably see Giant Hamburg better. <laughs> that's in the little Route 66 park there. And there is a new Red's that's open, not on the same location, but I've not been there, but I hear it's pretty nice. The date, May 17th, 1956, young Elvis Presley shows up and performs in Springfield. Tickets cost $1.50, and it was a half full house. This might have something to do with, he's about four or five months from appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show. When he was in town, he stayed at the Railhaven Motel, Today is part of the Best Western, and it's a 1950s vintage motel. Yeah. One of the cool things about it, it's got a rail fence around the outside, and you can actually, if you're really an Elvis fan, you can rent room 409, the Elvis room. <laughs> you have to pay more to sleep in a big Cadillac. <laughs> Most of the rooms are typical of the 1950s, but they don't come with dogs. You gotta bring your own dogs. The Railhaven also has a tribute to the old Burma Shave signs. Remember those? If you're not familiar with Burma Shave, they would have advertisements that had a rhyme, a jingle, and there was often a, a message there that was kind of cool. One of them was, and I, this is a real one, don't blame me. It's best for one who hits the bottle to let another use the throttle perma shape. <laughs> These were located about a half a mile apart, you have a couple of words, about 20 feet off of the road. Burma shave advertising is honored at the Railhaven. They did this, not me. Listen, birds, these signs cost money, so roost a while, but don't get funny. Burma shape. And there's the real fence. <laughs> The Lurvy Tourist Court opened by Bert and, Lur Bert and Irene Lurvy in 1928. It included a gas station and six wooden double duplex cabin, six duplex cabins. By the 1950s, they put the giraffe rock over the outside. The cost was $2 a night, and it was available to anyone regardless of skin color, an unusual thing given the Jim Crow laws at this time were the norm. In fact, they were listed in the Green Book as one of the motels that blacks should go to while in Springfield. Uh, you can see the buildings, uh, they went through weekly rentals for a while, which is usually a sign the end is near. Eventually, they were torn down as a nuisance according to the city, but they did save some of the materials. Hopefully, they can re reconstruct some of these. But I was lucky enough to be there in January and they were torn down the following July. In 1926, Route 66 followed the old Ozark to Carthage Road. Here, a small community new, known as Paris Springs sprang up. Say that real fast, Paris Springs sprang up. <laughs> Highway travel helped the community make it through the Great Depression. The Gay Perita gas station was opened by Fred and Gay Mason, and it's a classic 1920 sort of gas station. Unfortunately, in 1955, a fire destroyed it, and the, the property set empty until 2005 when Gary Taylor purchased the property and built a vintage station 
not a replica but it's on the same location and that's kind of cool spencer casey having learned that the new i was coming purchase some property and built a building along the old stagecoach road and in that building he had there in spencer a barber shop a cafe a store and a gas station this might have been the first strip mall along Route 66. <laughs> Not only is Carthage the home to the outlaw Bell Star of Missouri, outlaws Bonnie and Clyde, Bell Star, Jesse James, but for years Lake Kellogg attracted a lot of lake enthusiasts. So there were plenty of tourist accommodations built. Boots Motel opened in 1936, and that is probably the one attraction that we think of with Carthage. In real estate, there's a saying, location, location, location. That must have been what Arthur Boots was thinking when he built this place, because it sets right at what he called the crossroad of America, and that is US 66 and 71. 71 goes from Canada down to uh, New Orleans. Arthur designed the building himself in Art Deco style with bull nose or rounded corners, and he hoped to have the ultimate traveling experience for each one of his guests. That included a carport. See, we've got the carport, the garage. This was nothing new with the Carl Court. Many A-list celebrities stayed there at the court, including Clark Gable, who apparently came back to visit an old army friend from the war. Mickey Mantle, the baseball player, was probably out there hunting or enjoying the lake. And I have no idea why Gene Autry once stayed there, but apparently he did. Boots catered to what he called the better sort by charging the exorbitant rate of $2.50 a night. When asked in an interview, he said, for $2.50, you get the better sort. He continued and said, $2.50 will also keep out the riffraff. I don't think you could say that today. I might have gotten along with old boots. You can see that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, one of the uh, amenities he had was a radio in every room. He was proud of that. In fact, one of the recent ads I looked there for it says, we do not have TV, but we still have a radio in each room. <laughs> it's a throwback motel now. Then and now, the green lighting around the office helped the court stand out. By the early 2000s, it had become a single room, low income housing uh, unit. It was almost torn down to build a Walgreens. However, in 2011, Deborah Harvey and Priscilla Bledsaw purchased and refurbished it to a 1949 appearance. They recently retired and now it's owned by a community group where these folks chipped in their money and purchased this. In the mid 1940s, Boots expanded his operation across the street to the Boots drive in since not all travelers were on the same nine to five schedule, Boots thinking outside the box did something no one else was doing, breakfast at any hour. Today, it's the Great Plains Federal Credit Union, and I would say this is a very impressive uh, example of repurposing. It's got the original integrity there, plus the accommodations needed for the current occupants. So it is pretty cool. Our final stop, Chopwood. The Bonnie and Clyde garage apartment. In 1933, they held up there for a couple of weeks, or a couple of, no, several weeks is what I've got here. When the police found out they were there, they attempted to arrest them. They had a gunfight. Two police officers were sadly killed. And of course, a couple fled in a hurry. They left some of their stuff behind, including a camera. And then that camera was filmed with some of the classic Bonnie and Clyde pictures. Now I noticed when I was putting these together, she's wearing the same dress in every picture. Is that her photo dress? Were they all the same day? I think Clyde has a different, he doesn't have a vest on there, but maybe he just didn't care. She wanted to get dressed up and they're taking pictures, I don't know. So that pretty much concludes our Missouri uh, Mother's Road. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. I enjoyed being here. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Thank you.
Yes. Thank you.